And I'd like to turn uh, uh, for a text this morning to the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, the letter uh, of the Apostle Paul to the Hebrews. And chapter 4, and these very um, familiar words from verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 4. Where the Apostle writes these words, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now the Apostle in uh, uh, the letter to the Hebrews sets out before us uh, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there is no letter in the New Testament, I think, that sets out more fully uh, the excellencies, the glory of Christ in his person and also in his offices as our prophet and our priest and our king. And he does so because there were those who were wanting to turn back. There were those who were uh, wanting to go back to Judaism wanted to go back to the shadows and uh, the apostle has to remind them that if they turn from the Lord Jesus Christ they turn from uh, a saviour uh, who is all sufficient uh, that they turn uh, from hope to no hope they turn from light to darkness they turn from hell to heaven that we should not seek any but the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to be our help and our hope for all uh, eternity. And we're reminded uh, really on this Reformation Sunday, aren't we, uh, that uh, there are those today who are putting their trust in men to please plead their cause before God. You know, there are those who will enter a confessional today. There are those who will trust in the priest. There are those that will uh, trust in, uh, in, in, in all manner of things, in all manner of rituals, uh, but these can be of no help whatsoever. Uh, we have one, one great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, he is all we ever need in this world and in eternity. As Wesley said in his hymn, Thou, O Christ, art all I want, more than all, in the I find. And so we're going to look at what the Apostle tells us here in uh, the end of chapter 4 of, of, of Hebrews concerning our Saviour, uh, the Lord Jesus. First of all, of course, we've got to remind ourselves what does a priest do? Uh, we have a great high priest. Well, uh, why do we need a priest? Uh, well, a priest is one who represents men before God, who represents us before God. And so he stands before God representing men. Now, that's something we could never do ourselves and in ourselves. If we were to stand before Almighty God this morning, if we were to stand before the Holy One, well, we would be utterly consumed. We need one. Uh, to plead our cause, we need one uh, to offer uh, a sufficient sacrifice for our sins uh, before the Father. Uh, we need one to intercede continually for us uh, before God the Father in heaven. And we do, we have uh, this high priest in the Lord Jesus Christ and he is all sufficient. I wonder uh, just to ask this morning, just to ask uh, this question, uh, what is your hope? As you contemplate standing before God, who, who have you to plead your cause? Uh, some would say, well, well I, I'll plead myself. 
I'll plead my own cause. I'll stand before God and I'll say on that day, well, um, I, I, I've been here in this world and I've done this and I've done that and I'll, I'll plead my own cause before God. Well, uh, people say all manner of things in their pride uh, in this world, you know. Uh, but let me tell you this, no man will say or utter a word before God on that day. All mouths will be stopped on that day. Uh, not one will say, ah, hang on, I've got something to say. Utterly silent, utterly mute before God. All mouths will be stopped and the whole world stand guilty before God. And so uh, if you're thinking this morning, well, I've got... Uh, myself to plead my own cause before God, well, that won't avail. Uh, maybe you say, well, I've got a church to plead before God. I'll plead then that I'm, uh, I've been here in this place throughout my life. I'll plead uh, what the church believes. I'll plead what, uh, what others say uh, here in Cephas. Well, my friends, that won't avail. That won't avail. Well, I'll plead what my, 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 my mother believed. I'll plead what my father believed. I'll plead what my ancestors believed. I'll plead what Luther said, because uh, uh, we're, we're, we're in the line of, uh, 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 of the reformers. Uh, my friends, that won't avail. There is only one person who will stand for you I will plead your cause on that day, and that's Christ. And if you're not found in him, then it's going to be absolutely disastrous. Coming through the heads of the valleys this morning, beautiful, beautiful part of the world, isn't it? Sun shining, looking up one side towards the mountains. You know, people on that day will call for those mountains to fall on them. To hide them. From the presence and the wrath of the Lamb. There's only one that will plead your cause on that day. One high priest. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's consider him. Let's, let's think about him this morning. And really there are two things. Uh, in this portion I want to draw out. First of all, he is a great high priest. Verse 14, a great high priest. And then from verse 15 onwards, he is a sympathetic high priest. He is a, a compassionate high priest. So he is a great high priest and he is a compassionate high priest. And both those things should be very, very precious to us. First of all, look at the words of the apostle here, seeing then that we have a great high priest. Now there were many high priests in the Old Testament. Aaron was in a high priest in the Old Testament, the family of Aaron and his sons were high priests in the Old Testament, but none were great. Uh, the apostle doesn't say here we have a high priest that is passed into the heavens, but we have a great high priest. In other words, he stands out. He's unique. He is great. He is above all. In fact, uh, if you carry on in Hebrews, you'll see that he is not of the line of, of Aaron at all. He's of a, a greater uh, line. He's of the uh, line of the order of Melchizedek and uh, Melchizedek, that, man, that great man that even Abraham paid tithes to in the Old Testament. In other words, the apostle is drawing out for us how great the Lord Jesus is. How wonderful, how excellent he is as our high priest. Well, how is he excellent? Well, uh, let's just note some things. He's great in his person, isn't he? He's great in his person. Who have we to stand before the Father. Who have we to plead our cause this morning? Poor, wretched people that we are. Who, who have we to stand before God? Well, we have Jesus, says the Apostle, verse 14, Jesus, the Son of God. 
And so we have one who is the greatest. There's none better than him. There's none greater than him. Uh, there's none that, uh, that, that surpasses him. Here is our high priest. His name is Jesus. He is the God man. Uh, he is the second person of the Holy uh, Trinity. Uh, but he is uh, the, uh, the, the Savior. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Uh, and that reminds us that uh, the one who is our Savior is not only God, but he is man also, very God, fully God, perfect God, perfect man, very man, uh, in, in one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the unique person uh, of our Savior, uh, our High Priest. Uh, and uh, this is the one that pleads our cause. We haven't an angel. Uh, we haven't a mere man to plead our cause. We have the Son of God himself. As God, he is conqueror or sin and death and hell. As man, he sympathizes with us in our weaknesses. This is our high priest where well, he's great in his person. He's great also in his purity. Uh, look at what the Apostle says. He goes on to say he was tempted uh, in all points, like as we are, yet without sin, verse 15, yet without sin. Here is one who is altogether pure, altogether pure. You know, in the Old Testament, uh, the high priest, uh, he had garments, you know. He wore these clothes, he wore these garments. And they were called garments of beauty and glory. And he had a mitre on his head and he had a a long white robe and he had a, a robe of blue and he had a breastplate with the names of the children of Israel upon his breast and upon his shoulders and ephod and all these, these garments. Now why did God provide these garments for the high priest? Why? Well because my friends the high priest himself could never live up to what a high priest should be. He had, for example, a mitre on his head that said, Holiness unto the Lord. But uh, whoever you, you think of in the Old Testament, uh, he never lived up to that. He was never holiness unto the Lord. Think of Aaron. Think of when Moses came down from the mountain, didn't he? Uh, with the Ten Commandments written on stone. Uh, and he came down and what did he find at the bottom of the mountain? Well, he found uh, the children of Israel uh, having a riot. Uh, what have they done? Uh, well, they had made a, a, a golden calf. They had made a, a, an idol. Uh, and they were worshipping it. They were saying, "This is the, the, these are thy gods that have brought thee out of the land of, of Egypt. And, and who was uh, ahead of all that? It was Aaron. He, 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 he uh, along with the children of Israel, fashioned this golden calf. Uh, was he holiness unto the Lord? No, he wasn't. And so for the high priests of the Old Testament to appear before God, they needed these garments that really ceremonially described what a high priest should be in his person and in his purity. Now then, the Lord Jesus doesn't need any garments. The Lord Jesus doesn't need a mitre on his head saying holiness unto the Lord. He doesn't need a robe of white to signify his purity and his righteousness. He doesn't need a breastplate with the, uh, the, the names of the children of Israel there to, uh, to, to, to remind him to plead their cause. 
He doesn't need any of that because he is altogether pure. Altogether blameless. He is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. What does that mean? Holy, uh, pure within, pure heart, pure life, pure inwardly, pure outwardly, without the stain of sin, without any mark of sin, without original sin, without actual sin, pure before the Lord, harmless, harmless in other words before men. He only did that which was good. You see, we are harmful at times. We harm one another. Uh, we, we, we break the second table of the, the Ten Commandments against one another, don't we? We don't honour uh, our, our, our elders, our uh, uh, parents and those in authority. We, we, uh, at times we, we murder in our hearts and in, uh, with our tongues. We, we lie one to another. We, we are unfaithful. We covet. We... Uh, we desire things that aren't ours. We run after other gods and so on. Uh, we're harmful towards one another uh, so often. Now, the Lord Jesus, he was harmless. He did sinners good and only good. Never harmed. He went about doing good, undefiled. So he was in this world. And he, he was in the closest contact with sinners. And yet that never corrupted his nature in any way. That never affected him in any way so that he took upon himself the stain. He was completely undefiled by sin and sinners. He was separate from sinners. Uh, he was, if you divided humanity when he was in this world, you would have one great lump of sinners and you would have the Lord Jesus Christ. Separate from sinners. And yet, a man in this world. How pure he was. How utterly pure in his nature. But then also... Let's think of the provision he made. Let's think of the provision he made. Uh, I live down in West Wales and sometimes I travel from um, Saundersfoot on the road up to Aberystwyth. And if you go on that road, you come to a place uh, near uh, Llanabyddir. Uh, and uh, there is one building Near Llanaba there, I would never want to go in. I pass it every time, but I never want to go in there. And it's the West Wales Abattoir. And uh, it says uh, on the, the gate, I pass it, and it says livestock enter here. And I think, well, they go in alive, <laughs> but they don't come out. Alive and it's a place in it of death, and it's a place really of blood. Must be a, a very well, I, I wouldn't want to go in there. But thinking about that, my friends, when you read in the New Testament of the tabernacle and the temple. Don't have any romantic ideas of what they were like. It was a place of death. It was a place of blood. The worshipper would come and they would come with a lamb. And the worshipper would lay his hands heavily upon that pure, spotless lamb. And that really was symbolic of the lamb becoming his substitute. The lamb now taking his sin and his guilt. And the lamb then will be taken 
and it will be killed, it will be slain, its blood will be spilt and sprinkled on the altar, and its body burned upon that brazen altar, and the smoke of the offering would rise, a sweet savour to the Lord. It was an atonement for sin. And lambs will be brought in the morning, and lambs will be brought in the afternoon, and bulls and goats and heifers and whatever birds. They would all be slain. Day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out. And not one of them could provide any forgiveness or pardon for sin. Thousands upon thousands, millions upon millions slain throughout the history of the Old Testament and they could never give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain. But Christ, Christ the heavenly Lamb, here he is and he comes. And willingly, he offers himself. He's the high priest. He's the offering. He's the altar. And he offers himself upon Calvary's cross for our sins. And my friends, in one sacrifice, he brings eternal redemption to those who are his. Once and for all, once was enough. Once was enough for him to suffer in the darkness of Calvary and he brought eternal salvation for you and for me who believe upon him. Not all the, the, the seas in the world could wash away my, my sin, nor the burnt offerings of the Old Testament, but Christ once and for all, when he laid down his life on Calvary, sealed my redemption with his blood. He provided that perfect, sufficient atonement for all our sins. <clears throat> and so here is the one uh, he, uh, who is our high priest, his person is excellent, he pure in every way, and his provision himself laying down his life has secured for us forgiveness and pardon for all of our sins, past, present, and future. He sealed our pardon, he sealed our redemption with his blood. Why do we need another? We don't need another. Why think about another this morning? We don't need any other. We have all we ever need in the Lord Jesus Christ. He and he alone is our high priest. Well, finally this morning then, let's look at his compassion. Verse 15, because you see he wants to apply this to us as well. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. And here you see the apostle is underlying aligning for us how compassionate, how merciful, how gentle our high priest uh, is. Uh, he is he's merciful, he's compassionate towards sinners. He's compassionate towards sinners. Uh, don't ever fear coming to the Lord Jesus. The sinner need not fear coming to Christ. Here is one who is so compassionate, so tender, so gentle, that any may approach him. 
I love my, my Welsh hymns, you know. My Welsh hymns, they're, they're, they're beautiful. And there's one that speaks of, of Magdalene being washed as white as snow. And Saul of Tarsus being pardoned. And then it goes on to say, really, well, if, if they were washed, I can be too. I can come if, if Saul of Tarsus was pardoned and he called himself the chief of sinners, a vile man, an injurious man, the terrorist of his day, if he could receive pardon, if mercy overflowed towards him, why do any one of us doubt that if we come to Christ, he will not fully pardon us. So compassionate, so merciful. But he's also compassionate towards his people. He's compassionate towards the Christian. He's compassionate to you and I this morning. He understands, says the apostle here, we don't have a high priest which can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. I, I, I began my ministry in, in, in Sanethi. And uh, when I was in Sanethi, I, I had, uh, I had a, a season ticket for, for uh, the Scarlet, uh, for Stradi. And um, I had a season ticket in the old stand. And in the old stand, that's where most of the, uh, how can I put it, uh, that's where most of the old women used to sit. You see, and uh, it, was, it was entertaining listening to them. Uh, it was, you know, the things they used to shout uh, at the players on the pitch. And, uh, you know, they, they, they had advice for every single moment of a game, you know. Uh, and, and if a player did something wrong here, they would be shouting, why did he do that? He should have done this, he should have done that. You know, and I used to think to myself, you know, they're, they're, they're so loud with their mouths. But none of them have ever played a game of rugby in their lives. What do they know about 80 minutes on the pitch uh, against the Ospreys or against the, 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 the wasp, Wasps, as it were, or, or Gloucester? What, what do they know? Uh, they're shouting advice, they're telling the players what to do. What do they know about the pressures of playing professional rugby? What do they know about the split-second uh, split decisions that have to be made? What do they know? They don't know a thing. Never been on the pitch. Find a shout from the sidelines. What do they know? Now, you see, when it comes to our Saviour, when it comes to our Saviour, he knows. You may be here this morning and You know, your spirit may be sad, disappointed. Men disappoint people. And you think, well, I have a saviour who understands. He too was disappointed, he too was betrayed. He understands loss. He stood at the grave of Lazarus and wept, didn't he? He understands loneliness. He understands being alone. For all of his disciples forsook him and fled. He understands the troubles and the trials of this world. He understands what it is to be weary and tired. He understands the storms of life. 
and he's compassionate towards his people. It says here in verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. It was interesting in one commentary by, by A.W. Pink. A.W. Pink says that one way you can translate that is that you can come openly before the throne of grace. And what it means is that you don't have to pretend before this saviour, before this high priest that we have. You don't have to put on a show. You know, if you were going before King Charles and standing in his presence and he was to ask you, how, how are you today? You would say, oh, I'm very well, thank you. Whether you were very well, whether you were very bad, whether you, you know, uh, the last thing he would do is to say, well, I've got a backache this morning, my knees are hurting, and uh, you wouldn't say that, would you, to the king? But you see, before our king, before our high priest, we can come just as we are, pour out our griefs, pour out our trials, our troubles, lay them openly before him. Isn't that what Paul did? That thorn in the flesh? What did he do? Did he hide it from the Saviour? Oh, three times he came before the Saviour. He pleaded and the Saviour said, my grace is sufficient. And he knew his grace to be sufficient. And he came openly, he came openly before the Saviour, and we can too, not hiding anything but just saying things as it is. Yesterday, uh, and I'll end with this, yesterday um, there was a funeral in, in Aberystwyth, uh, a preacher, uh, he was a hundred years old, but he's a great man, godly man. But he was a man of prayer. He was a man of prayer. Uh, and uh, you could see the closeness of his relationship to the Saviour. The story is told once of how he and another uh, minister was stuck in snow. They were caught in a snowstorm and they were travelling by car and they got to the top of the hill and they couldn't go any further. And he said, we must pray. And do you know what his prayer was? Lord, we're stuck. Remarkable. No pretense. No putting on a good show. Coming before the throne of grace. Because the throne of grace dispenses grace. And saying, as it was, Lord, we're stuck. And a few minutes later, somebody came along, pulled them out of the snow. And the old preacher said, now then, he said to the other man, you drive and I'll give thanks. That's how he was. We have a high priest who is great. Don't ever turn away from him. But we have a high priest also who is so compassionate, merciful, that we can come just as we are, openly, and bring before him, yes, our sins and our needs and our burdens, and whatever we're facing in this world, 
and we receive grace and help and mercy in times of need. Well, we thank God for such a saviour. Now we're going to turn to end to number 530.